The Rape of the Lock Alexander Pope Part 1 What dire offense from Amaris causes springs, what mighty contests rise from trivial things, I sing this verse to see. Muse. Is due. This, even Belinda may vouchfaff to view, slight is the subject, but not so the praise, if she inspire, and he approve my lays. Say what strange motive, goddess. Could compel a well-bred lord to assault a gentle bell? Oh say what stranger cause, yet unexplored, could make a gentle bell reject a lord? And dwells such rage in softest bosoms then? And lodge such daring souls in little men? Saw through a white curtains shot a timorous ray, and opt those eyes that must eclipse the day. Now lap dogs give themselves the rosing shake, and sleepless lovers, just at twelve, awake, thrice rung the bell, the slipper knocked the ground, and the pressed watch returned a silver sound. Belinda still her downy pillow pressed, her guardian self prolonged the balmy rest. Twas he had summoned to her silent bed the morning dream that hovered o'er her head. A youth more glittering than a birth night bow, that even in slumber caused her cheek to glow, seemed to her ear his winning lips to lay, and thus in whispers said, or seemed to say, Fairest of mortals, thou distinguished care of thousand bright inhabitants of air. If ere one vision touched thy infant thought, of all the nurse and all the priest have taught, of airy elves by moonlight shadows seen, the silver token, and the circled green, or virgins visited by angel pal single quotares, with golden crowns and wreaths of heaven leaf flowers, hear and believe. Thy own importance know, nor bound by narrow views to things below. Some secret truths from learned pride concealed, to maids alone and children are revealed, what though no credit doubting wits may give? The fair and innocent shall still believe. Know then, unnumbered spirits round thee fly, the light militia of the lower sky. These, though unseen, are ever on the wing, hang o'er the box, and hover round the ring. Think what an equipage thou hast an air, and view with scorn two pages and a chair. As now your own, our beings were of old, and once enclosed in woman's beauteous mould. Thence, by a soft transition. We repair from earthly vehicles to these of air. Think not, when woman's transient breath is fled, that all her vanities at once are dead, succeeding vanities she still regards, and though she plays no more, o oh, er looks the cards. Her joy in gilded chariots, when alive, and love of Umbra, after death survive. For when the fair in all their pride expire, to their first elements the souls retire, the sprites of fiery termagants in flame mount up and take a salamander's name. Soft yielding minds to water glide away, and sip with nymphs, their elemental tea. The graver prude sinks downward to ignum, in search of mischief still on earth to roam. The light coquettes and sylphs sloth repair, and sport and flutter in the fields of air. No farther yet. Whoever fair and chaste rejects mankind, is by some sylph imbracked, for spirits, freed from mortal laws, with ease assume what sexes and what shapes they please. What guards the purity of melting maids, in courtly balls, and midnight masquerades, safe from the treacherous friend, and daring spark, the glance by day, the whisper in the dark. When kind occasion prompts their warm desires, when music softens, and when dancing fires. Tis but their sylph, the wise celestials know, though honor is the word with men below. Some nymphs there are, too conscious of their face, for life predestined to the gnome's embrace. These swell their prospects and exalt their pride, when offers are disdained, and love denied. Then gay ideas crowd the vacant brain, while peers and dukes, and all their sweeping train, and garters, stars, and coronets appear, and in soft sounds, your grace salutes their ear. Tis these that early taint the female soul, instruct the eyes of young coquettes to roll, Teach infants' cheeks a bidden blush to know, and little hearts to flutter at a bow. Off when the world imagine women stray, the self's throw mystic mazes guide their way, throw all the giddy circle they pursue, and old impertinence expel by new. What tender maid but must a victim fall to one man's treat, but for another's ball? When Floria speaks, what virgin could withstand, if gentle Damon did not squeeze her hand? With varying vanities, from every part, they shift the moving toy shop of their heart. Where wigs with wigs, with sword not sword not strive, bows banish bows, and coaches coaches drive. 
this erring mortal's levity may call, O blind to truth. The sylphs contrive it all. Of these am I, who thy protection claim, a watchful sprite, and Ariel is my name. Late, as I rang the crystal walls of air, in the clear mirror of thy ruling star I saw, alas! Some dread event impend, ere to the main this morning's sun descent. But he even reveals not what, or how, or where, warned by thy sylph, O pious maid beware! This to disclose is all thy guardian can. Beware of all, but must beware of man. He said. When Shock, who thought she slept too long, let up, and walked his mistress with his tongue. Twas then Belinda, if reports say true, thy eyes first opened on a billet due. Wounds, charms, and ardors, were no sooner read, but all the vision vanished from thy head. And now, unveiled, the toilet stands displayed, each silver vase in mystic order laid. First, robbed in white, the nymph intent adores with head uncovered, the cosmetic pow single quotares. A heavenly image in the glass appears, to that she bends, to that her eyes she rears. This inferior priestess, at her altar's side, trembling, begins the sacred rites of pride. Unnumbered treasures up at once, and here the various offerings of the world appear. From each she nicely calls with curious toil, and decks the goddess with the glittering spoil. This casket India's glowing gems unlocks, and all Arabia breathes from yonder box. The tortoise here and elephant unite, transformed to combs, the speckled in the white. Here files of pins extend their shining rows, puffs, powders, patches, bibles, billet do. Now awful beauty puts on all its arms. The fair each moment rises in her charms, repairs her smiles, awakens every grace, and calls forth all the wonders of her face. Sees by degrees a purer blush arise, and keener lightnings quicken in her eyes. The busy sylphs surround their darling care. These set the head, and those divide the hair, some fold the sleeve, while others plait the gown. And Betty's prayed for labor is not her own. Part two not with more glories, in this ethereal plain. The sun first rises o'er the purpled main, then issuing forth, the rival of his beams launched on the bosom of the silver Thames. Fair nymphs, and well-dressed youths around her shone, but every eye was fixed on her alone. On her white breast a sparkling cross she wore, which Jews might kiss, and infidels adore. Her lively looks a sprightly might disclose, quick as her eyes, and as unfixed as those, favors to none, to all she smiles extends. Oft she rejects, but never once offends. Bright as the sun, her eyes the gazers strike, and, like the sun, they shine on all alike. Yet graceful ease, and sweetness void of pride, might hide her faults, if bells had faults to hide, if to her share some female errors fall, look on her face, and you'll forget them all. This nymph, to the destruction of mankind, nourished two locks, which graceful hung behind unequal curls, and welcome spurred to deck with shining ringlets her smooth foray neck. Love in these labyrinths his slaves detains, and mighty hearts are held in slender chains. With hairy sponges we the birds betray, slight lines of hair surprise the finny prey, fair tresses man's imperial race ensnare, and beauty draws us with a single hair. This adventurous baron the bright locks admired, he saw, he wished, and to the prize aspirate, resolved to win, he meditates the way by force to ravish, or by fraud betray. For when success a lover's toil attends, few ask, if fraud or force attained his ends. For this, ere Phoebus rose, he had implored propitious heaven, and every pow single quote ardort, but chiefly loved to love an altar built, of twelve vast French romances, neat a guilt. There lay three garters, half a pair of gloves, and all the trophies of his former loves. With tender billet do he lies the pair, and breathes three amorous sighs to raise the fire. Then prostrate falls, and begs with ardent eyes soon to obtain, and long possess the prize, the pal single quotares gave ear, and granted half his prey single quotar, the rest, the winds dispersed in empty air. But now secure the painted vessel glides, the sunbeams trembling on the floating tides, while melting music steals upon the sky and softened sounds along the waters die. Smooth flow the waves, the zephyrs gently play Belinda smiled, and all the world was gay. All but the sylph, 
with careful thought suppressed, this impending woe sate heavy on his breast. He summons straight his denizens of air. The lucid squadrons round the sails repair, soft o'er the shrouds aerial whispers breathe, that seemed but zephyrs to the terrain beneath. Some to the sun their insect wings unfold, waft on the breeze, or sink in clouds of gold. Transparent forms, too fine for mortal sight, their fluid bodies half dissolved in light. Loose to the wind their airy garments flew, thin glittering textures of the filmy dew. Dipped in the richest tincture of the skies, where light disports and ever mingling dyes, while every beam new transient colors flings, colors that change whene'er they wave their wings. Amid the circle, on the gilded mast, superior by the head, was Ariel plucked. His purple pinions opening to the sun, he ride his azure wand, and thus begun. Ye sylphs and sylphids, to your chief give ear, fays, fairies, genie, elves, and demons hear. Ye know the spheres and various tasks assigned, by laws eternal, to this aerial kind. Some in the fields of purest ether play, and bask and whiten in the blaze of day. Some guide the course of wandering orbs on high, or roll the planets through the boundless sky. Some less refined, beneath the moon's pale light hover, and catch the shooting stars by night. Or suck the mists in grosser air below, or dip their pinions in the painted bow, or brew fierce tempests on the wintry main, or o'er the glebe distill the kindly rain. Others on earth o'er human race presigned, watch all their ways, and all their actions guide, of these the chief the care of nation's own, and guard with arms divine the British throne. Our humbler province is to tend the fair, not a less pleasing, though less glorious care. To save the powder from too rude a gale, nor let this imprisoned senses exhale, to draw fresh colors from the vernal flow single quotares, to steal from rainbows ere they drop and show single quotares a brighter wash. To curl their waving hairs, assist their blushes, and inspire their airs. Nay oft, in dreams, invention we bestow, to change a flounce, or add a fear bellow. This day, black omens threat the brightest fair that e'er deserved a watchful spirit's care. Some dire disaster, or by force, or slight, but what, or where, the fates have wrapped in night. Whether the nymph shall break Diana's law, or some frail china jar receive a flaw, or stain her honor, or her new brocade, forget her prey single quotares, or miss a masquerade, or lose her heart, or necklace, at a ball. Or whether he even has doomed that shock must fall. Haste then ye spirits. To your charge repair. The fluttering fan bees ever at his care. The drops to thee, Brillanti, we consign. And Momentilla, let the watch be thine. Do thou, Crispisa, tend her fave right look. Ariel himself shall be the guard of shock. To fifty chosen sylphs, of special note, we trust this important charge, the petticoat. Oft have we known that sevenfold fence to fail, though stiff with hoops, and armed with ribs of whale. Form a strong line about the silver bound, and guard the wide circumference around. Whatever spirit, careless of his charge, his post neglects, or leaves the fair at large, shall feel sharp vengeance soon overtake his sins, be stopped in vials, or transfixed with pins. Or plunged in lakes of bitter washes lie, or wet whole ages in a buck in eye, gums and pomatums shall his flight restrain, while clogged he beats his silken wings in vain. Or alum styptics with contracting power shrink his thin essence like a riveled flower. Or as ixion fixed, the wretch shall feel the giddy motion of the whirling mill, in fumes of burning chocolate shall glow, and tremble at the sea that froze below. He spoke. The spirits from the sails descend. Some, orb in orb, around the nymph extend, some through the mazzy ringlets of her hair, some hang upon the pendants of her ear. With beating hearts the dire event they wait, anxious, and trembling for the birth of fate. Part three close by those meads forever crowned with flow single quotares, where Thames with pride surveys his rising toe single quotares, there stands a structure of majestic frame, which from the neighboring Hampton takes its name. Here Britain's statesmen oft the fall for a doom of foreign tyrants, and of nymphs at home. Hear thou, great Anna, whom three realms obey, dost sometimes counsel take and sometimes tea. Hither the heroes and the nymphs resort, to taste awhile the pleasures of a court. 
in various talk this instructive hours they passed, who gave the ball, or paid the visit last, one speaks the glory of the British Queen, and one describes a charming Indian screen. A third interprets motions, looks, and eyes. At every word a reputation dies. Snuff, or the fan, supply pause of chat, with singing, laughing, ogling, and all that. Meanwhile declining from the noon of day, the sun obliquely shoots his burning ray. The hungry judges soon the sentence sign, and wretches hang that jury men may dine. The merchant from TH exchange returns in peace, and the long laborers of the toilet cease Belinda now, whom thirst of fame invites, burns to encounter two adventurous knights, at Ambersingly to decide their doom, and swells her breast with conquests yet to come. Straight the three bands prepare in arms to join, each band the number of the sacred nine. Soon as she spreads her hand, this aerial guard descend, and sit on each important card, first aerial perched upon a matadare, then each, according to the rank they bore. For sylphs, yet mindful of their ancient race, are, as when women, wondrous fond of place. Behold, four kings in majesty revered, with hoary whiskers and a forky beard, and four fair queens whose hands sustain a flow single quotar, this expressive emblem of their softer pal single quotar. Four knaves in garbs succinct, a trusty band, caps on their heads, and halberds in their hand. And particolored troops, a shining train, draw forth to combat on the velvet plain. The skillful nymph reviews her force with care. Let spades be trumps, she said, and trumps they were. Now move to war her sable matadores, and show like leaders of the swarthy moors. Spade Leo first, unconquerable lord. Led off two captive trumps, and swept the board. As many more Manilio forked to yield, and marched the victor from the verdant field. Him Bosto followed, but his fate more hard gained but one trump and one plebeian card. With his broad saber next, a chief in years, the hoary majesty of spades appears puts forth one manly leg, to sight revealed. The rest his many-colored robe concealed. The rebel knave, who dares his prince engage, proves the just victim of his royal rage. Even mighty Pan that kings and queens overthrow, and mowed down armies in the fights of Lu, sad chance of war. Now, destitute of aid, falls and distinguished by the victor spade. Thus far both armies to Belinda yield. Now to the barren fate inclines the field. His warlike Amazon her host invades, this imperial consort of the crown of spades. The club's black tyrant first her victim deed, spite of his haughty mien, and barbarous pride, what boots the regal circle on his head, his giant limbs in state unwieldy spread? That long behind he trails his pompous robe, and of all monarchs only grasps the globe. The baron now his diamonds pours apace. This embroidered king who shows but half his face, and his refulgent queen, with pal single quotares command, of broken troops and easy conquest find. Clubs, diamonds, hearts, in wild disorder seen, with throngs promiscuous throw the level green. Thus when dispersed a rooted army runs, of Asia's troops, and Afric's sable sons, with like confusion different nations fly, in various habits and of various dye, the pair battalions disunited fall, in heaps on heaps, one fate overwhelms them all. The knave of diamonds now tries his wily arts, and wins, O oh shameful chance! The queen of hearts. At this, the blood the virgin's cheek forsook, a livid paleness spreads o'er all her look. She sees, and trembles at this approaching ill, just in the jaws of ruin, and cadile. And now, as oft in some distempered state, on one nice trick depends the general fate. An ace of hearts steps forth, the king unseen lurked in her hand, and mourned his captive queen. He springs to vengeance with an eager pace, and falls like thunder on the prostrate ace. The nymph exulting fills with shouts the sky, the walls, the woods, and long canals reply. O oh, thoughtless mortals! Ever blind to fate, too soon dejected, and too soon ill it. Sudden these honors shall be snatched away, and cursed forever this victorious day. For lo! The board with cups and spoons is crowned, the berries crackle, and the mill turns round. On shining altars of Japan they raise the silver lamp. The fiery spirits blaze. From silver spouts the grateful liquors glide, 
and China's earth receives the smoking tide. At once they gratify their scent and taste, while frequent cups prolong the rich repast. Straight hove around the fair her airy band. Some, as she sipped, the fuming liquor fanned, some o'er her lap their careful plumes displayed, trembling, and conscious of the rich brocade. Coffee, which makes the politician wise, and see throw all things with his half-shut eyes, sent up and vapors to the barren spray new stratagems, the radiant lock to gain. Ah, cease rash youth. Desisier tis too late, fear the just gods, and think of Scylla's fate. Chang to a bird, and sent to flit in air, she dearly pays for Nisius injured hair. But when to mischief mortals bend their will, how soon they find fit instruments of ill. Just then, Clarissa drew with tempting grace a two-edged weapon from her shining case. So ladies in romance assist their knight, present the spear, and arm him for the fight. He takes the gift with reverence, and extends the little engine on his finger's ends, this just behind Belinda's neck he spread, as o'er the fragrant steams she bends her head, swift to the look a thousand sprites repair, a thousand wings, by turns, blow back the hair, and thrice they twitched the diamond in her ear. Thrice she looked back, and thrice the foe drew near. Just in that instant, anxious Ariel sought the close recesses of the virgin's thought. As on the no Sergei in her breast reckoned, he watched this ideas rising in her mind, sudden he viewed, in spite of all her art, an earthly lover lurking at her heart. I must, confessed, he found his pal single quotar expert, resigned to fate, and with a sigh returned. The peer now spreads the glittering forefix wide. T enclose the lock. Now joins it, to divide. Even then, before the fatal engine clode, a wretched sylph too fondly interposed. Fate erred the shears, and cut the sylph in twain, but airy substance soon unites again. The meeting points that sacred hair to sever from the fair head, forever and forever. Then flashed the living lightnings from her eyes, and screams of horror rend this affrighted skies. Not louder shrieks to pitying heaven are cast. When husbands or when lapdogs breath their last, or when rich china vessels, fallen from high, in glittering dust and painted fragments lie. Let wreaths of triumph now my temples twine, the victor cried, the glorious prize is mine. While fish in streams, or birds delight in air, or in a coach and six the British fair, as long as Atlantis shall be read, or the small pillow grace a lady's bed, while visits shall be paid on solemn days. When numerous wax lights in bright order blaze, while nymphs take treats, or assignations give, so long my honor, name, and praise shall live. What time would spare, from steel receives at state, and monuments, like men, submit to fate. Still could the labor of the gods destroy, and strike to dust this imperial to single quotares of Troy. Still could the works of mortal pride confound, and hew triumphal arches to the ground. What wonder then, fair nymph? Thy hairs should feel the conquering force of unresisted steel? Part four but anxious cares the pensive nymph oppressed, and secret passions labored in her breast. Not youthful kings in Batel seized alive, not scornful virgins who their charms survive, not ardent lovers robbed of all their bliss, not ancient ladies when refuse to kiss, not tyrants fierce that unrepenting die, not Cynthia when her mantos pinned awry, Ear felt such rage, resentment and despair, as thou, sad virgin, for thy ravished hair. For, that sad moment, when the sylphs withdrew, an aerial weeping from Berlinda flew, umbriel, a dusky melancholy sprite, as ever sullied the fair face of light, down to the central earth, his proper scene, repairs to search the gloomy cave of spleen. Swift on his sooty pinions flits the gnome, and in a vapor reached the dismal dome. No cheerful breeze this sullen region knows, the dreaded east is all the wind that blows. Here, in a grotto, sheltered close from air, and screened in shades from day's attested glare, she sighs forever on her pensive bed, pain at her side, and magrim at her head. Two handmaids wait a throne, alike in place, but differing far in figure and in face. Here stood ill nature like an ancient maid, her wrinkled form in black and white arrayed, with store of prey single quotares, for mornings, nights, and noons, her hand is filled, her bosom with lampoons. Their affectation with a sickly mean shows in her cheek the roses of eighteen, practiced to lisp, and hang the head aside, 
faints into airs, and languishes with pride. On the rich quilt sinks with becoming woe, wrapped in a gown, for sickness, and for show. The fair ones feel such maladies as these, when each new night dress gives a new disease. A constant vapor o'er the palace flies. Strange phantoms rising as the mists arise. Dreadful, as hermits' dreams in haunted shades, or bright as visions of expiring maids. Now glaring fiends, and snakes on rolling spires, pale specters, gaping tombs, and purple fires, now lakes of liquid gold, Elysian scenes, and crystal domes, and angels in machines. Unnumbered throngs on every side are seen of bodies changed to various forms by spleen. Here living teapots stand, one arm held out, one bend. The hand of this, and that the spout, a pipkin there like Homer's tripod walks. Here sighs a jar, and there a goose pie talks. Men prove with child, as powerful fancy works, and maids turn betels, call aloud for quarks. Safe pass them throw this fantastic band, a branch of healing spleenward in his hand. Then thus addressed the pow single quote our hail wayward queen. Who rule the six to fifty from fifteen, parent of vapors and of female wit, who give this hysteric or poetic fit, on various tempers act by various ways, make some take physic, others scribble plays. Who cause the proud their visits to delay, and send the godly in a pet, to pray. A nymph there is, that all thy pow single quote our disdains, and thousands more in equal mirth maintains. But oh! If e'er thy gnome could spoil a grace, or raise a pimple on a beauteous face, like citron waters matron's cheeks in flame, or change complexions at a losing game. If e'er with airy horns I planted heads, or rumpled petticoats, or tumbled beds, or caused suspicion when no soul was rude, or discomposed the headdress of a prude, or e'er to cost if lapdog gave disease, which not the tears of brightest eyes could ease, hear me, and touch Belinda with chagrin. That single act gives half the world the spleen. The goddess with a discontented air seems to reject him, though she grants his prey single quotar. A wondrous bag with both her hands she binds, like that where once Ulysses held the winds. There she collects the force of female lungs, sighs, sobs, and passions, and the war of tongues. A vile next she fills with fainting fears, soft sorrows, melting griefs, and flowing tears. The gnome rejoicing bears her gift away, spreads his black wings, and slowly mounts today. Sunk in Thalestra's arms the nymph he found, her eyes dejected and her hair unbound. Full o'er their heads the swelling back he rent, and all the furies issued at the vent. Belinda burns with more than mortal ire, and fierce Thalestra's fans the rising fire. O oh, wretched maid! She spread her hands, and cried, while Hampton's Zachos, wretched maid replied, Was it for this you took such constant care the bodkin, comb, and essence to prepare? For this your locks in paper durance bound, for this with torturing irons wreathed around? For this with fillets strained your tender head, and bravely bore the double loads of lead? Gods! Shall the ravisher display your hair, while the fops envy, and the ladies stare? Honor forbid! At whose unrivaled shrine is, pleasure, virtue, all, our sex resign. Methinks already I your tears survey, already hear the hard things they say, already see you a degraded toast, and all your honor in a whisper lost. How shall I, then, your helpless fame defend? Twill then be infamy to seem your friend. And shall this prize, this inestimable prize, exposed throw crystal to the gazing eyes, and heightened by the diamond's circling rays, on that her precious hand forever blaze? Sooner shall grass in Hyde Park Circus grow, and wits take lodgings in the sound of bow. Sooner let earth, air, sea, to chaos fall, men, monkeys, lap dogs, parrots, perish all. She said. Then raging to Sir Plume repairs, and bids her bow demand the precious hairs, Sir Plume, of amber snuff box justly vain and the nice conduct of a clouded cane, with earnest eyes, and round unthinking face, he first the snuff box opened, then the case, and thus broke out, Amperson quo. My lord, why, what the devil? Amperson quo. Z, D, S. Damn the lock. For gad, you must be civil. Amperson quo. 
plague on single quote. Tis past a jest, nay prithee, pox. Amperson quo. Give her the hair, he spoke, and wrapped his box. It grieves me much, replied the peer again, who speaks so well she'd ever speak in vain. But by this lock, this sacred lock I swear, which never more shall join its parted hair, which never more its honors shall renew, clipped from the lovely head where late it grew, that while my nostrils draw the vital air, this hand, which won it, shall forever wear. He spoke, and speaking, in proud triumph spread the long contended honors of her head. But Umbriel, hate Fulgnum, forbears not so, he breaks the vial whence the sorrows flow. Then see, the nymph in beauteous grief appears, her eyes half languishing, half drowned in tears. On her heed bosom hung her drooping head, which, with a sigh, she arrived. And thus she said, Forever cursed be this detested day, which snatched my best, my favorite curl away. Happy! Ah, ten times happy, had I been, if Hampton Court these eyes had never seen. Yet am not I the first mistaken made, by love of course to numerous ills betrayed. Oh, had I rather unadmired remained in some lone isle, or distant northern land, where the gilt chariot never marks the way, where none learn imbra, none e'er taste bahia. There kept my charms concealed from mortal eye, like roses that in desarts bloom and die. What moved my mind with youthful lords to Rome? Oh, had I stayed, and said my prayed single quo taras at home. Twas this, the morning omen seemed to tell. Thrice from my trembling hand the patch box fell. The tote ring china shook without a wind, nay, pulsate mute, and shock was most unkind. A sylph too warned me of the threats of fate, in mystic visions, now believed too late. See the poor remnants of these slighted hairs. My hands shall rend what even thy wrap and spares, these, into sable ringlets taught to break, once gave new beauties to the snowy neck. The sister lock now sits uncouth, alone and in its fellow's fate foresees its own. Uncurled it hangs, the fatal shears demand, and tempts once more thy sacrilegious hands. O oh, hadst thou, cruel, been content to seize hairs less in sight, or any hairs but these. Part 5 she said, the pitying audience melt in tears, but fate and Jove had stopped the baron's ears. In vain the lustrous with reproach assails, for who can move when fair Belinda fails? Not half to fix the Trojan could remain, while Anna begged and Dido ragged in vain. Then grave Clarissa graceful waved her fan. Silence ensued, and thus the nymph began. Say, why are beauties prayed and honored most, the wise man's passion, and the vain man's toast? Why decked with all that land and sea afford, why angels called, an angel like adored? Why round our coaches crowd the white-gloved bows? Why bows the side box from its inmost rows? How vain are all these glories, all our pains, unless good sense preserve what beauty gains, that men may say, when we the front box grace, behold the first in virtue, as in face. Oh! If to dance all night, and dress all day, charmed the small pox, or trust old age away, who would not scorn what huswife's cares produce, or who would learn one earthly thing of use? To patch. Nay ogle, might become a saint, nor could it sure be such a sin to paint. But since, alas, frail beauty must decay, curled or uncurled, since locks will turn to grey, since paint, or not paint, all shall fade, and she who scorns a man, must die a maid. What then remains, but well our pal single quotar to use, and keep good humor still whate'er we lose? And trust me, dear, good humor can prevail. When airs, and flights, and screams, and scolding fail. Beauties in vain their pretty eyes may roll. Charms strike the sight, but merit wins the soul. So spake the dame, but no applause and should. Belinda frowned, Thalestris called her prude. To arms, to arms. The fierce virago cries, and swift as lightning to the quumbate flies. All side in parties, and begin this attack. Fans clap. Silks rustle, and tough her lebans crack. Heroes and heroines shouts confessedly rise, and bass, and treble voices strike the skies. No common weapons in their hands are found, like gods they fight, nor dread a mortal wound. So when bold Homer makes the gods engage, 
and heavenly breasts with human passions rage. Gainst Pallas, Mars, Latona, Hermes arms, and all Olympus rings with loud alarms. Jove's thunder roars, heaven trembles all around. Blue Neptune storms, the bellowing deeps resound. Earth shakes her nodding toe single quote the ground gives way. And the pale ghosts start at the flash of day. Triumphant Umbriel on a squance's height clapped his glad wings, and safe to view the fight, propped on their buck and spears, the sprites survey the growing combat, or assist the fray. While throw the press and ragged the lustrous flies, and scatters deaths around from both her eyes, a bow and whittling perished in the throng, one deed in metaphor, and one in song. O cruel nymph! A living death I bear, cried Dapperwit, and sunk beside his chair. A mournful glance surf oppling upwards cast, those eyes are made so killing, was his last, thus on meanders flow remarching lies this expiring swan, and as he sings he dies. When bold Sir Plume had drawn Clarissa down, Chloe stepped in, and killed him with a frown. She smiled to see the doughty hero slain, but at her smile, the bow revived again. Now Jove suspends his golden scales in air, wheezed the men's wits against the lady's hair. The doubtful beam long nods from side to side. At length the wits mount up, the hairs subside. See fierce Belinda on the barren flies, with more than usual lightning in her eyes. Nor feared the chief this unequal fight to try, who sought no more than on his foe to die. But this bold lord, with manly strength endued, she with one finger and a thumb subdued, just where the breath of life his nostrils drew, a charge of snuff the wily virgin threw. The gnomes direct, to every atom just, the pungent grains of titillating dust. Sudden, with starting tears each eye o'erflows, and the high dome re-echoes to his nose. Now meet thy fate, enchanced Belinda cried, and drew a deadly bodkin from her side. The same, his ancient personage to deck, her great-great-grandsire wore about his neck in three seal rings which after, melted down, formed a vast buckle for his widow's gown, her infant granddam's whistle next it grew, the bell she jingled, and the whistle blew. Then in a buckin cracked her mother's hairs, which long she wore, and now Belinda wears. Boast not my fall, he cried, insulting foe. Thou by some other shalt be laid as low. Nor think, to die dejects my lofty mind. All that I dread, is leaving you behind. Rather than so, all let me still survive, and burn in Cupid's flames, but burn alive. Restore the lock. She cries. And all around restore the lock. The vaulted roofs rebound. Not fierce Othello in so loud a strain roared for the handkerchief that caused his pain. But see how oft ambitious aims are crossed, and chiefs contend till all the prize is lost. The lock, obtained with guilt, and kept with pain, in every place is sought, but sought in vain, with such a prize no mortal must be blessed, so heaven decrees. With heaven who can contest? Some thought it mounted to the lunar sphere, since all things lost on earth, are treasured there. Their heroes' wits are kept in ponderous vases, and bows and snuff boxes and tweezer cases. Their broken vows, and deathbed alms are found, and lovers' hearts with ends of our band bound. The courtier's promises, and sick man's prey single quote the smiles of harlots, and the tears of heirs, cages for gnats, and chains to yoke a flea, dried butterflies, and tomes of casuistry. But trust the muse, she saw it upward rise, though marked by none but quick poetic eyes. So Rome's great founder to the heave single quo tenet withdrew, to Proculus alone confessed in view. A sudden star, it shot through liquid air, and drew behind a radiant trail of hair. Not Baroness's locks first rose so bright, the heave single quo tenet bespangling with disheveled light. The sylphs behold it kindling as it flies, and pleased pursue its progress through the skies. This the bowman shall from them all survey and hail with music its propitious ray. This, the blessed lover shall for Venus take, and send up vows from Rosamonda's lake. This partridge soon shall view in cloudless skies, when next he looks through Galileo's eyes. And hence this egregious wizard shall foredoom the fate of Louis, and the fall of Rome. Then cease, bright nymph, to mourn the ravished hair which adds new glory to the shining sphere.
not all the tresses that fair head can boast shall draw such envy as the lock you lost. For, after all the murders of your eye, when, after millions slain, yourself shall die. When those fair suns shall set, as set they must, and all those tresses shall be laid in dust. This lock, the muse shall consecrate to fame, and midst the stars inscribe Belinda's name.